face While the storm calls upon me And there's no hiding place In the crash of the thunder Precious Lord, hear my cry Keep me safe till the storm passes by Till the storm passes over Till the thunder sounds no more Till the clouds roll forever from the sky Hold me fast, let me stand In the hollow of the hand Keep me safe till the storm passes by Many times Satan whispered There is no need to try For there's no sorrow, there's no hope by and by, but I know thou art with me, and tomorrow I'll rise where the storms never darken the skies, till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. And the storms come no more Let me stand in thy presence On that bright peaceful shore In that land where the tempest never comes Lord, may I dwell with thee When the storm passes by Till the storm passes over Till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Children's Church at this time. If you guys will make your way in an orderly fashion to Mr. Lee. Everyone else, if you'll please open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Thank you for that special. Let me enjoy singing for God so loved the world that he gave his only son to die on Calvary. He sent to set me free someday. He's coming back before he'll be. That's not the one we sing, is it? We're just one yeah, it is. Okay. You know, that songwriter plagiarized from John 3.16. And I like it. Uh, you know, the, the, the more Scripture is in a song, uh, the more, well, the more it ministers and the more timeless those same songs become. You know, that is something that sets apart, like, the hymn book from a lot of uh, other songs. There, there are some good songs being written today. Uh, there are some good songs that have been recently written and that I have a profound appreciation for. But for the most part, throughout the ages, most songs don't make it beyond the generation that they were written for. In other words, there are literally hundreds of thousands of songs, Christian songs, that have probably been written this year and you haven't heard of most of them, right? And uh, maybe they're written to be sung in a in a group. I, I've written songs before uh, for youth group. We've sung them, and they've been really, you know, for that group, they've been songs that ministered. There have been songs that have been popular during different periods or ages. But the songs don't always make it. They're just not timeless classics. But you know that the ones that are in your hymn book, they're the ones that made it. Uh, you can look at some of them are just four or five hundred years old. And some of them are, you know, written in the last 50 years or so. And some even more recently than that have been written that aren't there yet. 
go find out what the classics are and we'll put them in our hymn book. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why you, know, you say, Pastor, you know, I would rather have a more um, contemporary worship service in our church. And, and different people mean different things when they say that. For instance, contemporary means up to date, right? It means contemporary with today. And I'm not against somebody writing a song today and singing it. Uh, we a lot of our special songs are contemporary in that sense because they've been written, you know, recently. Uh, and we've actually, you know, that's a lot of what we do when we do special music would be the more contemporary music. But a lot of those songs just don't seem to be as timeless as the ones that we usually sing as part of our worship. And I think that uh, the, the praise music in the church ought to be tested a little bit just to see if it has lasting effect. And I'm not, I'm not giving you some kind of doctrinal uh, requirement for music, but I wanted to help you with some thinking about how we think about music here. Sometimes I think that folks will come to our church and because of our size or because of the way that we do music, uh, sometimes they think, well, these folks just, <laughs> they just don't like good music. Well, uh, we're trying to develop our music in our church, and what we want is to have the kind of music we can have good confidence about. That is, this is, this is well-pleasing to the Lord, and we do have some standards of what we look for uh, with that, and also uh, we want to do it as well as we can. We, you know, there's always going to be somebody that can do it better, isn't there? Somebody, you know, the strongest guy is only the strongest until he meets the guy that's stronger than him. And the best singer is only the best singer until he meets someone else. So we're not going to do it to compare ourselves. We want to praise the Lord uh, with our music, and that's the thought process behind it. We'd like to involve you with our special music. And Brother Charlie is the guy that's technically in charge of special music. And we have practices, actually, 515 on Sunday nights. You say, Pastor, how come there aren't specials every service? Well, because people don't always show up for practice on Sunday night. And we don't, we don't sing music we haven't practiced. Uh, we think that if it's going to be special, it ought to be special, not because it's bad, <laughs> but because, uh, because we've invested in it. So I thank, thank the, I'm thankful for the folks that are working on our special music. And I wanted to maybe, uh, for our church, give you a little bit of an idea. Now, for contemporary music, uh, I do not embrace contemporary music, which considers itself to be contemporary because it is culturally contemporary. In other words... When I'm fine with contemporary music that's recently written, but I'm not going to try to imitate the latest world's band or group, which a lot of churches do. And uh, again, I'm not, I'm not speaking about. I'm speaking about con from conviction about what's right for us as a church. And we're not trying to be like the. You know, I don't even know what the latest bands are. You know, I'm still stuck in the '80s, so <laughs> I don't know what would be the latest of the, of the world's group. But I can tell you this, if we were cutting edge with our music as far as the world's culture goes, we would include those individuals that are cutting edge and we would exclude everyone else. In other words, you may not like the latest rap style. Some people might. You may not like the latest rock or the latest country and western or the latest whatever, and other folks might. But when you include a group or when you you know, model yourself after culture, you've just modeled yourself after something which is temporary. Contemporary is temporary. Uh, and that's the reality of it. And so that's one of the reasons we stick to the timeless classics. They've been tested, proven. Uh, we've really got a clear conscience about the music that we sing in our church. We're uh, not trying to love the world or the things that are in the world. And that's what I think a lot of times that notion is is we're just like you, we're just like the world, is what we're saying when we do something. And folks, that's not what we're just like, are we? We're not just like the world. Uh, we've been saved from out of the world. And so one of the things that we strive in our church to be is biblically relevant, not culturally relevant. You cannot hang with the culture. And I can see that some of you aren't even trying. <laughs> Matter of fact, I don't see anybody in here wearing skinny jeans today. Yeah. I don't know where Tashi is. He yeah, always yeah. kind of squirms a little bit when I say that. But I don't see anybody wearing skinny jeans here today. And you know what? The reason I suspect that that's so is that they're on the way out. Thankfully, <laughs> they're on the way out. Um, 
I don't see anybody here wearing the baggy pants, the sag and bag them pants uh, right now. I mean, thankfully, that one took a long time to get rid of. The bell bottoms, I don't see anyone wearing bell bottoms here today. And I'll tell you why, it's most of y'all are just too old to, to change your wardrobe every time the trends change, isn't it true? And you look kind of, you ever see the, you know, the 50 year old guy that's trying to be a teenager? Everybody, everybody's like, mm -hmm, trying to be a teenager. Teenagers are like, I'm 50 year old trying to be a teenager. Everybody laughs at him because he's trying to be contemporary uh, to the culture. And I want to tell you something, if you want to be contemporary, you're going to get left. I've said many times to guys in the ministry, that when uh, you're young, when you're younger than 30, you're too young to know anything. That's what everybody thinks about you. I, I was full-time in the ministry when I was 21 years old. I graduated college. I've been preparing uh, for more than four years uh, in college to be in the ministry. been interning in churches for five or six years. And so I wasn't new to the ministry at 21. But at 21 years old, I knew what my Bible said, but nobody believed I knew anything because I was too young. And, uh, you know, until you're 30, you're too no young to know anything. And then after that, you're too old to be relevant. And so, uh, in other words, my point is, folks, let's, let's, let's just focus on the Lord. Let's focus on God. And let's, let's try to just be able to relate to Him. Because uh, you'll be left behind any, any other way. You may be with it today. And the generation that's coming four years behind you is going to think you are so behind the times and you so don't get it. And you don't know what's going on in life and in the world. Isn't it true? Mm -hmm. I look at Eileen. Eileen, how are you now? How old are you? 22. She's 22. Four year old. <laughs> wow. How do 17 year olds look at you? They think you're hip and cool and, and with it? Sometimes they're mistaken by them. Yeah, sometimes they think she's still wearing skinny jeans. Okay. <laughs> no, she's done with that. All right. You know what? When you get to be 22, year old, 22 years old, you know what 13 year olds think about you? You are so old, you don't even know what fun is. Yeah. Like, you are, like, what are you doing smiling? What are you doing laughing? Like, you don't even know what there is to smile about at your age. Old people don't even know how to have fun. And you're, you are like, it's amazing how fast you get to be considered old. And again, I just want to point that out this morning. Sometimes it's good to talk with the folks in our church so you uh, know where we're coming from. I, uh, I've had people... Uh, recently, not from our church, but say, you know, I, you know, about music, I don't like the churches that sing the hymns and so forth. Well, I do, actually. I like that we have, first of all, the notes to read. I think it's a travesty <laughs> that even churches that sing the hymns only put them up on the, uh, the uh, jumbotron or whatever. Uh, I think it's a travesty that they do that because people don't learn to sing anymore. They don't know how to read. You know, when the note goes up, you go up. When it goes down, you go down. And we've lost our congregational singing as a result of that. We've just a, a lot of uh, singing if it isn't just a phrase or a chorus that you can shout or yell with a group. And then those choruses, man, they go so fast once you learn them. Then, then uh, they usually aren't timeless. And, and so I, I like what we do for our music here. I just want to do it a lot better. And so we need your involvement with it. If you don't like the music, well, come get involved with it, and it'll be a lot better. Let me share a story with you that brought it to my, my attention. Uh, a lady, last night we were in uh, West Park Baptist Church and they're having, they're having revival services up there this week and we, they were having youth services Friday and Saturday, so we were up there. A lady sitting next to me confided in me. She said, uh, I love this church, uh, West Park Baptist Church. And I do too, that's, like, that's my, my home church, that's where I'm from uh, in South Florida. She said, I love this church. She says, I go somewhere else on Sunday. I said, she said, I tithe here, but I go somewhere else. She said, the reason I tithe here, she said, when my kids were growing up, this church impacted their lives so much. And they just have taught us so much. They've been so good for our family. This has been a great church. So I come here Wednesday night and Sunday night, and like Saturday night, I come every Saturday night. They had service on Saturday night. She said, I'll go here Sunday. So where do you go on Sunday? I go to the mall, to the church in the mall. <laughs> And uh, she's, it's like the secret, you know. She's like letting it, she didn't know I was a pastor. When she found out I was a pastor and I used to be staffed there, she probably knows now she's exposed. I'm going to rat her out. Okay. But uh, anyway, so she said, I go to the mall. And uh, I said, oh, okay, you go to the mall. Oh, and some, some church there, she said, yeah, because I like the, you know, we do the praise and worship there. And she said, this church is just so dead, they just sing the hymns. 
And then Brother Chris or Brother Johnson gets up and he lets the teenagers pick the hymns. And I mean, those teenagers were singing it. Yeah. And she looks at me and she goes, they usually sing a lot slower than that. Mm -hmm. you know? And then they picked another song. They really sing that all. She says, I don't know why they're so slow on Sunday mornings, but it's just really good right now. I like it a lot. And you know what? The hymns are actually great songs to sing. I, she cracked me up just because of, you know, I, I just just the things she was telling me and so on and so forth. I've just heard a lot. But uh, she, what she told me was that I go to a church that actually isn't, in, in her mind, isn't as good a church. Uh, this church has taught her kids the Bible, has reached her children, uh, reached her family, has ministered to her. But she goes somewhere else because she wants contemporary music. And by contemporary, what she means is what I was talking about. You know, it's the latest. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of that line of thinking, a lot of line of reasoning. And so... Anyway, I uh, just want to mention that this morning so that you understand. It's not because we didn't know that there's new stuff. It's just I can't hang with the latest and greatest. I'm aging every year. And I don't have a good enough memory for the stuff I've always done. I can't learn everything new and then have it be irrelevant within a year or two of time. And that really is what happens if you try to be contemporary. Your, very, your relevancy is temporary. And so that's one of the reasons why we do some of the things we do. There's more to it than that but that's a lot of it. Are you in Revelation chapter 2? Let's talk about the church today. And uh, this is going to be a real help for us. Revelation chapter 2, will you please go down to verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith even in those days, where Antipas was my faithful martyr, which was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saying, saving he that receiveth it. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Isn't there a lot of interest in our text today? I want to give you as much as I can as far as material goes to understand the text today. But it would be a travesty if we did not get what the Holy Spirit's saying here, which is really... A whole lot of rebuke. There's some commendation in this in this portion of the Scripture, but there's a lot of rebuke to churches, and if we miss it and let it go right over our heads, we might be on the wrong side of God's judgment someday. And so this is an important passage of Scripture. Father, thank You for what we're able to learn in the Scripture today. And God, I'm just asking that You help with our understanding. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, here we are in Revelation. If you have not been with us, thus far in our study. And by the way, I recommend that you uh, get online and, and uh, watch the messages up until uh, this portion of Revelation because there's an important context here which I cannot share uh, with you by way of review or we'd be here at 2 o'clock probably if I uh, recut or covered everything that we've covered so far. Suffice it to say this, a couple of important things we've looked at up until this point is one, that there's a blessing for the folks that read, hear, and do the things that are written in this book. And so this is literally a personal letter to you with a promise from God for you that you'll have God's blessing in your life if you read, you hear, and you do the things that are written in Revelation. That was the first week's message. Second week's message that we saw was that Revelation is chronological. Revelation is chronological, and it is that portion of the Scripture which helps us to know when a lot of the events which are arranged topically in the Old Testament, what the order of events 
For those are looking back at the things which we already know are in the past, and then the things which are in the present, which is the church age, and then the things which will be in the future. And so, uh, Revelation's chronological, and one of the reasons there is such a problem today, and there always has been, uh, there, but there's such a resurgence of people who have so much, so many questions or so much doubt or just are just uh, convinced the wrong way about future events is because they don't understand Revelation's a chronological book. Having understood that, one of the things that we see is that the outline of Revelation is write the things which were, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. That is past, present, future. That is the chronological uh, outline of the Revelation. Presently, we are in Revelation in the portion which is written to the present tense group, that is the church age, and coincidentally we're talking about churches in this context. You'll see when we're finished with our uh, study of the seven churches that are mentioned in Revelation, you'll see that never once again is the church mentioned in Revelation. You'll see the four and twenty elders, which I believe uh, is a representation of the church. You'll see that in heaven, but you won't see the church on earth ever again. Future events that God will be doing will involve national Israel, which have come to Jesus uh, in belief. And you'll see the 12 tribes, 12,000 of every tribe. You'll see people out of all the nations believing in, in uh, God and in Jesus, but you'll never see the church again. They'll be coming to God as the Messiah of the Jews. And so uh, salvation has always been the same. It's faith in Jesus Christ. But the church age is a special age. It's the age of the Holy Spirit of God. And that's one of the reminders in each of the letters to the seven churches is that God's going to remove His Spirit from you. Now, I wish I could comment on everything that we've covered in the last couple of weeks, but we really need to get into our context today. The message to the church at Pergamos. Again, go online, watch the messages that we've had up to this point. But uh, the message to the church at Pergamos is loaded uh, loaded not only with detail, but with truths and with what I find to be very convicting application. That's nice truths that I'm like, oh, I better, I better ponder this. I better consider it. You ever uh, just had truth presented to you and you thought, you know what? I'm not sure if that applies to me, but if it does, I'm in trouble. And so I better take some time to do business with God. And that's the way these letters to the seven churches are. Uh, each of them have characteristics that can apply to Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. And they're written in the Scripture so Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church can say, oh, we better change. We better straighten up. You ever uh, been faced with uh, imminence, an imminent return? Uh, that is, you're a child. All of us were children here once, though some of you probably cannot recall it. It was so terribly long ago, especially if you're Frank. But uh, some of us, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, Frank, Frank's like the child, like the guy is still, he, you know, are you 56 now? 57, 57, 58. You get older every year. I know. Every single year. It's, yeah. it's horrible. He's 57, he thinks he's about seven, like as far as the age you feel. You feel like in your mind, like seven, right? You have the, the zest of a right, second. Right around there. Yeah. Uh, he, he acts like he's five, doesn't he, Jane? Yeah, okay. All right. We're, we're no not going to go any. We're stopping here no. with that. But uh, the reality of it is all of us were children. Remember when your parents would say, you know, you better have this done by the time I get home? Yes. You know? And if you had parents that had consistent schedules, you had an idea when they're going to get home. And it wasn't a real big deal when they first left <laughs> or when their return was a little far out. But. You might have looked at the clock like my brother and I did one time when we were playing a game of Monopoly that had already gone all night and uh, we were continuing in the daytime and realized that <laughs> we're out of time. Uh-oh. And, man, you talk about the fur flying. I mean, we made things happen. Uh, you know, we just I think that was clean your room the instance I'm thinking of. And I'm telling you, you know, things came out everywhere and things went into everywhere fast. And, uh, you know, we started, I don't know how many of you all do this when you were kids, but you start the stuffing process of the room cleaning. You know, the fake cleaning. <laughs> like all the stuff on the floor, you stuff it in the closet or under the bed, or some of you stuff it somewhere. 
and then when you get it stuffed, you're like, okay, now what if mom checks the closet or under the bed? And so then you start pulling the stuff out, the unstuffing process, and then you poke, poke things away one at a time as you unstuff them, but everything has kind of an appearance of neatness. And you hope that the unstuffing happens before mom returns, but maybe, <laughs> you know, you'll be half safe, half wear in there. You know what? Here's the deal. We as believers really just need to be just up to date on things, don't we? I, I wish all of us were like my wife. My wife just puts things away all the time. Uh, we always have one laundry basket in our house full of laundry. Well, but you know, actually, it's not full of laundry. We have one laundry basket, and that's that's our house. Like, they're just uh, Anthony, how many laundry baskets you have? About three of your own? Something like Anthony's got about three, but Melissa and I have about one, and it's usually about half full because she's just always doing the laundry. And uh, she comes, if there's laundry to be done, she does it. Just every, all the time. Uh, after every meal, she does the dishes, or Anthony does them after some meals. But it's just always done. So you don't ever have to come home and be like, wow, they've piled up. The laundry's piled up. The dishes have piled up. Because she just does them when they're supposed to be done. Now, I'm not trying to preach about how you should do laundry or do your dishes. That isn't how I do it. That's how my wife does it. Okay? But I tell her, there's a vandal. You know, I keep putting my dirty laundry in the basket and it keeps showing up folded in my drawer. I was doing this. We have a, somebody vandalizing our dirty laundry in our house. And so, <laughs> like, I keep putting the dirty laundry away and somebody keeps putting it, washing it and putting it in my drawer. You know, but I, I'm being sarcastic because I really appreciate my wife. She compliments me in some ways that are really, really nice. Uh, and, uh, but the reality of it is, is that we as believers really ought to, not, you know, spiritually speaking, we ought to be like the people that just don't let it pile up. You know, we just always, you know, keep things, you know, it's supposed to be done. We do it on schedule. And uh, it's amazing. I've been trying something, and we'll see how it works out. It'll take probably about 10 years before I have results. Uh, but I've been trying to put three things away a day. Just like, you know, I'm not talking about three things that I get out, but like, I've been trying to not leave anything out that I got out, and then just put three things away every day. You know, that, and... We're going to see what my garage looks like in about 10 years, I think. Huh? About maybe 20 years, right, Frank? You better push that back. Yeah, push it back a little bit. It's his turn to get me now. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just try to, try to organize. Well, you know, spiritually speaking, that's the way we ought to look at some of the things to the church, is that these are things that we're not going to have time to update later. We better just get things where they're supposed to be now and stay up to date on them. Well, here we are looking at the church at Pergamos. It's interesting, uh, probably... Has anyone ever been to to Pergamos? It's uh, I think it's it's Bergama today. as would be the the, the city it's of Bergama. What? It's in West, Turkey, Western right? There's Turkey, yeah. yeah, it's in Western Turkey. And how, how many of y'all have been to to Bergama? Okay, so I'm gonna make up some facts about it since nobody can actually <laughs> knows the reality of it. Uh, Pergamos would have been the uh, high city in Turkey, and. Uh, Pastor McClure, I'm, I'm rambling so much today, I can't help this. Pastor McClure told me something funny yesterday. He said, he said there was a guy that told him that he has it on good information that North Dakota is a myth. <laughs> like there is no North Dakota. It's just made up. And he said, I can prove it to you. He said, how many of you have been to North Dakota? How many of you have been to North Dakota? Angela has? Liar. <laughs> Usually when you ask that question, I've been to North Dakota too, but I just went to check and see if it was a myth or not, and I realized it shouldn't be here. There's nothing worth existing for except for oil maybe and a couple of white buffalo, but uh, the reality of it is there's nothing in North Dakota. But he says, you ever been there? And he asks the second question, you ever know anybody has been there? You know anyone from there? And the answer is usually no, so see, it doesn't exist. It's not true. We have more evidence that there's a moon than we have of North Dakota because not only can we see the moon but there are people that have been there and we know who they are so anyway, except Angela just ruined everything we're like going to North Dakota way to go Angela all right well that's unrelated but this city in Pergamos uh, this city in Pergamos was the preeminent city in, in uh, that area of Turkey it would have been uh, settled under really the the time of the Greek Empire at its, at its zenith or its greatness and it was very, very high elevation. It was a city that's built literally on, on a cliffs. And so it would have been not only a very secure place, but a very lofty place, Pergamus would. And it would have been uh, sort of a, 
We've been one of those type of places that is not settled because of the practical aspects of it, but because of the attractive aspects of it. You know what I'm talking about? Everybody ever been like to um, uh, Vail, Colorado, or ever been to like a mountain city, mm -hmm. like a really, really high mountain city, mm -hmm. and you ask, I mean, if there's not been a gold rush there, the question is, why does anybody live this high? You know, wintertime is kind of dangerous. It's uh, slippery and icy, and the weather's not particularly great. But it's a beautiful place, and it's settled, not because it's practical to live there, but it's settled by people that uh, want to go there for the beauty of it. They're already, you know, they're not going there to work. They're going there to enjoy the place. And that would be kind of like Pergamos. It would have been uh, sort of a wealthy tourist town. It would have been a town that is established not because they have an ore or uh, they're close to... Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're part, close to shipping lanes or something like that. It would be a place that's settled because it can be. You know, it's a because we can kind of thing. Sort of like mil billionaires yachts. You ever uh, look at billionaires yachts or watch videos of them on YouTube and you realize these guys, they spend, you know, $200 million on a yacht and they never use it. And the question is why do you have a $200 million yacht that you, you know, you only look at once and never visit again? And the answer is because I can you know, and that's sort of Pergamus. It's a wealthy place, it's a lofty place, it's an exclusive place. It's a place that is really at a zenith of a successful time in the Greek Empire. And it is, a, I mean, it's, it's just one of those very, very special places. And uh, it's, it is a place that a church was established, was planted. And that same church, you know, there's about 20,000 people, uh, we believe at the time, that lived there. And one of the things that Pergamos was known for, though, was its idolatry, the idols that they worshipped. In particular, uh, you know, they, they had huge temples to Zeus and to Jupiter and I believe to uh, Apollo. And then they had a uh, particular unique idol that they worshipped, which was a serpent. And I don't know all the details of it. I'm, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not greatly educated in the idols. But they had a serpent. And I think that probably that is one of the reasons why uh, the Scripture says that that's the seat of Satan. In other words, where you live at, in verse uh, 13, you know, where Antipas was my faithful martyr, and where Satan dwelleth. Now there's something to be said about a town or a city where an angel who is not omnipresent the way God is has for his headquarters. Isn't there? You know the devil's not like God. God's everywhere and Satan isn't. He has his demons, his devils, all over the place. And he certainly got a well-organized, a well-oiled machine of evil but he's limited himself, actually. You couldn't put God in a place and, him, and he is restricted to that place, could you? Yeah. When the devil, when the Satan is cast into the bottomless pit, he'll be in there. That's where he'll be at. But you could put God in a bottomless pit. Well, you could put God in a bottomless pit. But were God in the bottomless pit, he'd be everywhere else, too. He's omnipresent. It's an attribute or characteristic of God. And I like to think about those things sometimes because sometimes we give too much credit to the devil. Sometimes we think of him as having too much ability. But actually, the devil's presence can be forbidden away from us by the blood of Jesus Christ as well as his minions. And we can have a Satan-free environment. Let me just tell you something. The devil's not welcome here today. The Satan is not welcome in this room today nor any of his, uh, of his little devils. They're not welcome here. Uh, the God Spirit's welcome here. God's presence is welcome in his in this place, and He's the preeminent person here. And where He's at, the devil cannot be. That's why a believer can't have a devil living in them. It's because God's Spirit dwells in us, and He does not cohabit with devils. And so here we are as believers, uh, seeing though that these individuals are at a place where Satan is prominent. Certainly that serpent which was worshipped probably was the physical manifestation of the devil. Now, 
Devil worship's getting to be popular. They're trying for trying to force it into our schools. Actually, can't worship God, but they're trying to, uh, you know, teach Satanism, Satanism classes, and uh, the the Satanists are trying to get in a place in a country uh, that's a Christian country. They're trying to get a place where they uh, have the right to be worshipped, and it's a travesty in a nation when people openly worship the Satan. And that's literally what is happening here at Pergamos. They've got a temple, they've got an idol that's representative of the serpent. And that's the town this church is in. Hey, we live pretty close to Wilton Manors. That's a pretty wicked place. Hey, let me give you a, a tip. Don't go down Wilton Drive on Halloween night when the Satanists come out. I'm telling you, they'll be all the way up Dixie Highway, almost up to this church. People walking around, prowling around in their devil costumes. And uh, there's, it's a wicked place. But it, it, it actually it doesn't even rival Pergamos. Pergamum. This church has open worship of evil idols and open worship of Satan. They have a temple for Satan. And it is a community temple. It's not uh, like most of the Satanists still are in our country where they're in secret places. They've got a prominent, preeminent temple. Probably have a lot more followers. They probably have many more followers uh, than the church which was at Pergamos. Antipas was a faithful martyr. I don't know anything about Antipas other than that he was a martyr. And that God... God the Son, Jesus, when He was giving this letter, tell the church at Pergamos this, He mentioned Antipas by name. And God said, I know about you. I know what you're going through. Listen, we looked at that last week at Smyrna, didn't we? That when you're suffering, God knows about your suffering. And that those that suffer, the ultimate promise to the church at Smyrna was, just hold on, be faithful, and you won't be touched by the second death. Boy, you can make it when you realize who's with you in suffering. God's with you in suffering. He knows about it. And He knows what you're going through. And uh, he, you're going to make it because He's with you. And, you. and no one can take your harm your soul. God's got that. You can't be touched by the second death. This church at Pergamos, it really just has... only thing it has that's positive to be said about this church, though, is that you are living in an evil place and uh, you, you use, there are people there that hold fast my name. Verse 13. They, thou dwellest even where Satan's seed is and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Okay, those are the positive things. Let's look at the, uh, the negative. And you're going to see from this point forward before for Ephesus a lot more positive to be said than, than rebuke. A lot more commendation than rebuke. Smyrna, there was no rebuke at all. But this church at Pergamos has a little bit of good to be said. You've held fast my name. There's a martyr there. And you just, just hold on. But now there is a, I'm going to deal with this city. I'm going to deal with you. And verse 14, But I have a few things against thee. First of all, because thou hast there them, them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. To summarize Balaam and Balak. Balak was the king, and Balaam was a prophet who God spoke to. And Balaam was hired by Balak the king to prophesy evil against God's people, Israel. But God wouldn't allow him to do it. He said, I only prophesy what God allows me to prophesy. He was willing to accept money from Balak to prophesy evil against the people that God loved. That's amazing, isn't it? So Balaam is not really a savory character, if you will. He's not a good guy. And so you could read the stories in the Old Testament about Balaam. But Balaam was unable to prophesy evil against Israel, but he still harmed Israel in a great way. And here's how he did it. He advised King Balak on how to undermine God's blessing for Israel. He said, get them to worship idols. Get them to worship idols, and then God will have to judge them. Teach them to worship idols, 
and God will have to judge them. He couldn't get God to, to uh, curse them. Couldn't curse them. Couldn't get God to curse them. But he said, get them to curse God and God will have to deal with them. And that was what Balaam taught the children of Israel to do. Now, the warning to the church at Pergamos here is a shocking one because it implies that in the church, idol worshipers had come in or people had come in who were teaching God's people to worship idols. You know, that's why worship's kind of important. It's why clarity in worship is important. Why knowing who we are and what we're supposed to be doing and having a free conscience, not just a free conscience, but a clean conscience about worship is important. Because my friend Balaam and his methods are in the church. And there are all kinds of people trying to redefine worship as something other than what God says it is. And it is idolatry. It's idolatry. And it was in the church at Pergamos. It's a warning. And friend, if it was a warning then, how much is it now? Read promotional church literature sometime. Just, just sample. Try to get just the trendiest churches in town and read sample literature from them sometime. And look at how they present themselves. Seldom is there a presentation of we hold the Word of God up as the ultimate authority. We love the Word of God. Seldom is the holiness, the character of God. God is holy. And we as believers strive to be a separated, set-apart, holy body as a result of it. Mostly it is some cultural thing that is an attraction. And friend, that's idolatry. So It's idolatry. And uh, sometimes it's, uh, if you're careful about it and you study the worship behind it, sometimes it's paganism that's in it. Let me, let me step on some toes. Would you mind? Look at your toes real quick. You ready for this? Let me step on your toes. I hate Easter egg hunts. I just hate them. They're pagan. They just are. Uh, you know, I don't buy the whole anti-Christmas tree thing. I'm not a Christmas tree, tr Christmas tree thing. But so long as people have decorated, they've decorated seasonally. Right? In the fall, we bring in leaves. I mean, look around here. We've decorated. We're not worshiping sunflowers. or You know what I'm saying? We're, not, we're just decorating with them. You know, and when, you, when, when the only pretty thing uh, as far as uh, plants go in the wintertime as an evergreen. We're not going to carve the thing and make an idol out of it and give it a name and worship it, bow before it. We're not doing that. I'm not, a Christ, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a Christmas tree guy, to be honest with you, but I don't hate Christmas trees. But I hate Easter eggs. <laughs> I do. An egg is a sign of fertility. Some people, well, it's a sign of birth. Well, Easter isn't about birth. The, the resurrection is not about birth, is it? Jesus was already born. That's Christmas time. So give me an Easter egg at Christmas time if you're going to try to scam me that direction. But uh, I'm a little bit too intelligent to accept it on, the, on Resurrection Sunday. And you know just about every church has an Easter egg hunt. And if they don't, then the people in our church... Hey, listen, if I don't have one in our church, people are going to leave and go to another church on Easter. They will. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to go hunt Easter eggs. And guess what? I'm still not going to have an Easter egg hunt because it's pagan. And it bothers me that you all sneak off and go uh, hunting around for eggs, buy some candy. I mean, this is really, I mean, it's, to me, I just don't see the attraction of having to open an egg to get your candy out anyway. You know, I mean, I, I, I'll confess, I like Cadbury eggs. Uh, one a year, I usually eat one a year, but I might get our conviction about it and cut it all together and not miss it. Who knows? I hate Easter because I think, I don't hate Easter, I hate Easter egg hunts. And I hate the bunny rabbits. I hate also because it's paganism that's been brought into the church. And the people that are bringing it in, you say, but pastor, it's a sweet old lady. Yeah, she's bringing idolatry into the church. You know, why don't the people that do evil in the church wear horns? Why aren't they cross-eyed? It's usually the good people that are cross-eyed, you know, and, and grow horns. I don't know why that is. But, uh, you know, evil is always appealing. I don't like snakes, but some people do. Snakes are very beautiful. And the serpent was the most beautiful of the beasts of the field, and he beguiled Eve. In other words, she just thought he was just the loveliest thing ever. And that's the way evil is. And you know something? 
more Christians than not will hate me for what I said about Easter. That's too bad, isn't it? Because honestly, it's not my life campaign. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to, you know, go and, and uh, smash the windows of a Bible bookstore and yank out the Easter eggs and stomp on them, anything like that. I'm not trying to, I'm not an Easter abolitionist or anything like that. I, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not really that big of a deal to me. I'm settled on it. I, it's just no big deal to me. But there are people that would stop coming to our church if they heard what I said about Easter. Seriously. You know, what's the deal with that? Well, there's an affinity there, isn't there? We have had people make the choice, people that could be Sunday school teachers, make the choice to go to different churches than this over the Easter egg thing. Because they want to teach Sunday school and they want to have Easter eggs and Pastor Price doesn't like Easter eggs. So they're going to go somewhere else over it. That's idolatry, I think. You say they're really good people. Pastor, are they believers? Yeah. The Bible says in the church. In other words, the, exclude, the inclusive word here is that people who are blood-bought, born again, are teaching idolatry in the church. They are playing the Balak and Balaam game in the church. And I want to warn you, Christian, you and I need to be afraid that it'll be us. I'm not going to die for a Christmas tree. I'm not going to die for an Easter egg. But there are people that literally, I mean, it's to die for. It's important. And, uh, you know, it's all these cute little kids, you know, uh, playing Easter eggs. And Pastor, you're taking away the fun for the cute little kids. I'm sorry about that. I don't have any response that <laughs> the Bible says in verse 14 to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication there are two commands in the scripture to the Gentiles who are believers of things you're not supposed to do fornication is one of the major ones and it's always connected with idolatry we're studying that on on Wednesday nights by the way we'll be uh, we've been looking at been in the context of that in our study on first Corinthians and you should be here for that it's a, it'll be a real help to you now there's another problem in the church so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. Nikao means to conquer. Laos is deity. Uh, Nicolaitans would be people that, for back, lack of a better way of phrasing it, people who have taken the affections or the loyalty of the church from a place that only belongs to Jesus and they've got it for themselves. You ever see where people, I mean, you better not say against Pastor Price because I'll disown you. I won't speak to you again. You know who's Pastor Price? Most of you don't know. You're like, who is Pastor Price? <laughs> it's me. I'm Pastor Price. Okay. Uh, better, you ever met someone who's just so loyal to the pastor that you better not, you better not, you know, in, in, in business meeting, you better say, Pastor, you know, I have some concerns about that. You know, we need people in our business meeting sometimes say, Pastor, I have some concerns about something. Because Pastor Price is just a human. Just a person. But there are churches where, you know, you don't contradict the pastor. Or you don't question the pastor. You just go along with it. And you ascribe loyalty to a man that only belongs to God. There are churches that have pastors that the people didn't choose. And the, people, the people in the churches got their pastor. And he's going to be your pastor and you have no choice about it. Well, what's that? conquering the people. In other words, the people don't have a say. The people, uh, you know, the Spirit the, the spirit of God, the priesthood, the believers, doesn't register as an important uh, consideration. It's conquering the people. And Jesus said, I hate that. I hate that. You know, a lot of denominationalism does that. Denominationalism conquers the people. I can't elaborate on that. Verse 16, we're going to finish up. Repent, or else I will come into thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. In this instance, in this, in this letter to this church, twice we've seen the reference of the sword. Him that hath the double-edged sword, the sword of my mouth. The sword is a picture of judgment. And the reminder is that the time that Jesus comes, He's coming with the sword. And it's going to be the sword of his mouth that he speaks the destruction and slaughter of all those who have rebelled against him. 
Friend, if you're holding on to idolatry and fornication and meat offered to idols, sin, licentiousness, lasciviousness in the church, God's against you. God's against you. And if I'm holding on to it, God's against me. And it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. All of a sudden, as we reflect, it gets a little silent. We have to ask the question, what does God think about me? Well, I'm going to tell you, my friend, I don't want God thinking I'm going to, I'm going to get them. I have to deal with them. This is what I want God to think about me. All right, now here's an encouragement, and and this is this is really really special, and I'm supposed to be done by now, so uh, the junior church is probably about to turn on its head, so I better hurry yeah. up. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You got ears? Do the, let's do the check real quick. Check. You got ears? Amen. You have them? Okay. Then it appears that this is written to you. Yeah. At least Angela's got ears this morning. She's been. You know, she did one, oh, I don't have ears, so we cut mine off. Or I wasn't born. There, I know there are people that don't have ears, but all of us do. Okay, so you got ears? All right. Then listen. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. You know, most people get conquered by the trend. Most people come under the dominion of the false teacher. Or when they're taught to worship idols or taught fornication or taught these things, they just succumb to it. But you don't have to. Because you have ears and you can hear. Let him hear. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And then it says, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Pastor, I just can't make it. I'm telling you, I just, you know, being a minority, being the only one, and everybody, man. I remember this, and again, I should be done, but I'm not. I'm sorry. I remember being 12 years old, and I remember my dad, who was a first-generation Christian, was really trying to live for the Lord. And I remember uh, being sitting in the office at his radiator shop while he's uh, he is rotting radiators, and uh, and another, a couple Christian guys came, and they came to confront my dad about something. Here's what they told my dad. They said. You think you're better than all the other Christians. You don't drink. You don't. And they named all the things that he didn't do that he had Bible convictions about. And they said, you think you're better than everybody else. And they said, I remember hearing this, they said, and you, you have your kids in that Christian school and you're making them weird. You're isolating them from lost people and they're going to they're gonna go out into the world someday and they're not going to know what to do and how to think and how to respond, and you're wrecking your children because you're raising them like Christians. That's what they These are Christian men that said that. And I remember my dad disputing with them, trying to explain why he believed what he believed and why he was doing the things that he'd done. He talked about how he'd grown up in the public school and been taught he was an animal and just about died from acting like one. But I just remember them saying that to my dad. And I remember it discouraged him. Matter of fact, I saw in his life spiritually, I saw a period of time where he was different because of that. Where it affected him. He made decisions even in parenting that were different because of what was said to him. And I look back today and I, I remember those men. I know them. And I think of them and I just think, you know what? You weren't serving God. You weren't representing God. You didn't have an open Bible you just had accusations. Not from the Word of God. Those are satanic accusations. Amen. The Bible says to him that overcometh. And you know, you as a believer, I promise you, you start living for Jesus and somebody's going to call you something. Years ago, I started just hitting people with my Bible all the time, so when they call me Bible thumper, it'll at least be true. Amen. <laughs> Billy Bible, goody two shoes, you know, mister, you think you're this, you think you're that. I know what I am, my friend. I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's all I am. But I was saved by a holy God. And as I've been conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, I need to look more like that than like the world. And I want to encourage you as a believer 
The gun knows the attacks that are made against you by family, by friends, by individuals, maybe Christians, that ought to support you more than tear you down. But I want to remind you also, there's somebody that knows what you're going through. And he said, to him that overcometh, he said, I'm going to give him something special. First of all, I'm going to give him the hidden manna. You know the person who loves the world isn't getting in the Word and getting the bread? That the person who sees what God's Word says and surrenders to it gets? There's special food for people that are willing to go against the flow, against, against the crowd, against the direction, the trajectory of people that are on their way to hell. And overcome that. There's sustenance for you. You'll make it, is what God is saying. I, you, you, they're going to starve you out? No, they're not. I'm going to feed you, is what God said. You're going to make it. And then He said, And I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. You ever study that? The white stone with the special name written in it? What is it, Pastor? Well, it's a, it's a white stone with a, special, with, a, with a special name written in it. When you're married, most married couples that love each other have names they give to each other which are not their given names. Snookums. I'm not talking to you, Frank. Are you Snookums? Uh -huh. Okay, good. <laughs> Most people that are married, they have pet names, don't they? And uh, they, they just have something that's just between the two of them. And it's, you know, it's not okay for anyone else to call them that name. Right? There's, there's things that I call my wife, it wouldn't be okay for you to call her. I'm not going to tell you what they are, it's between me and her. <laughs> it's our thing. And uh, you laugh anyway. It hurts my feelings when I get laughed at. <laughs> <laughs> you have a special close relationship with God. You're going to have times and you're going to have conversations. And you're going to have experiences that you can't even share with people because they're so personal, so intimate, so special between you and God. God said, you be faithful, and I'm going to give you a name. I'm going to give you a white stone. It's going to have a special name on it for you. It's going to be between me and you, something special. Some years ago, I found a rock on the railroad tracks, and it was really pretty. It was red. And uh, I took it home, and it was heart-shaped. It was naturally heart-shaped. And so I polished it. Took it home, I polished it, and I cut it a little bit, and, and then I uh, carved a name in it. And I gave it to my wife because I just studied this passage of Scripture. And I just wanted to give her something. It didn't have any, you know, it wasn't like, you know, this, this rock's worth, it could be, I don't know, maybe I better take it back from her <laughs> find out if it has some value. It's a pretty rock, but it doesn't have value in the sense of it's being a rock. But it's something between me and her. Is there something between you and God? Something special? I don't mean something against you and God. I mean something between you because of the relationship that you have with Him. God says to a church that's isolated and it's alone, that's in literally living in the city where the seat of Satan is. Satan's town. You think that's a tough place to live? You overcome. I'll give you something special. I want to move there. Because that would be worth it. Wouldn't it? That's the kind of God that you serve, my friend. When God shows you something in His Word like that, how does it impact your life? To make you think. So we live in such a wicked place. You've got to understand the family I come from. You've got to understand what my friends say. You know... The persecution that I undergo for Do you know God? Because He'll give you hidden manna to eat. You'll make it. And He'll give you a white stone with your name written with a name in it that He has just for you written in it. Mm -hmm. 
How many people have that? Is it worth it to live for Jesus? That's the compelling argument to the church at Pergamos. It'll be worth it all. Father, thank you for what we learned today. Lord, I just pray that you would help us with the absorption of it and the application of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Amen. Thank you. Do you need one Sure.